the next talk will be by Jürgen. Um, he will be talking about power saving. Um, he is a system engineer at uh, as a system software. What was it? Actually? Software systems. This word. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, and it's a follow-up to a talk that he gave two years ago on the Riot Summit, and he tries to uh, uh, present the learnings from the last years and to show that uh, in uh, in the meantime, uh, we as a community all managed to do for the last few years. Okay, have fun. <laughs> yes, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, so it's the third year I'm I'm talking on the riot summit and now I can't see faces. So <laughs> I really like that and uh, thank you for all the organization and the nice social event yesterday. It was it was absolutely worth it to stay until the end. <laughs> yeah, today I want to give you a little status uh, status report on seamless power management with Riot OS. And first of all, I want to tell you who I am. My name is Jürgen Fitschen. Maybe you've seen my handle on GitHub. It's pronounced U89. So <laughs> I don't know where that came from. It's historical reasons. Um, I'm working for the research and development department at SSV Software Systems in Hanover in Germany. And I'm using Riot since 2018. Yeah, of course, it's a follow up, by, but I think it's, um, it's good if we have the same um, knowledge. So I want to sync up and give you a little bit motivation, motivation and some basics on power management, why it's important. Then I want to give you an overview of Riot components that are in touch with all the power management stuff. And finally, I want to show you the current state of seamless power management. Yeah, why does good power management matter to us? So we are an IoT company, so we are industrial IoT. And during the last decade, um, consumer electronics moved to, to um, be driven by batteries and having wireless communications. And the industry starts to pick up this and yeah, also uh, building battery driven wireless IoT devices. And we have to optimize for long battery life because if you have to replace a battery, often it, uh, it costs a lot of money to, to, yeah, to take the device and replace the battery. So the longer it lasts, the better. And so we have to save energy with uh, smart power management here. Yeah, I gave you a little diagram about some fictional uh, um, application. It consists of four different phases. First of all, we have a measurement phase. So the IoT maybe measures, um, yeah, like a temperature or something like that. Then we have a, TR, a TX phase. So we are sending the measurement out to the network. Then maybe we have an RX phase. So we are waiting for packets from the network to be received. And after that, we are sleeping and the cycle goes on and on every five minutes. And the system is powered in this example by a 2.4 um, ampere hour battery and in the current configuration with the current consumption, this diagram is showing uh, the application would last to, um, for 0 0.27 years. And so now we need to optimize it. So maybe we can um, sleep or let the CPU sleep while, uh, while, the, uh, while the sensor is measuring the temperature. So this saves some energy, but we're still sticking with zero, uh, 0 0.27 years of lifetime. Um, but we can have the CPU also sleeping during sleep phase. And I've, if I do that, so going from one milliamps of current drawn 
to 10 micrograms, which is realistic for an IoT device, we're gaining almost 14 years of lifetime. So we really have to look for, for the sleep phase and optimize uh, the power consumption during the sleep phase. Yeah, um, how to achieve that? Because in the real world, we don't have just a slider to go to 10 micrograms and then we're done. <laughs> that would be very easy. So how does power management work? Oh, sorry. That's a little bit, yeah, uh, small. <laughs> I didn't have tested it with this resolution, but I, I can tell you. Um, so first of all, on the right side, we have a tiny microcontroller with a CPU and some peripherals around it. So we have maybe an RF interface, we have a UART, we have a high-speed timer, we have uh, GPIO functionality, and we have a low speed timer. And all those peripherals are driven by an external clock. And most systems have two different external clocks, one with a high speed, maybe 38 megahertz or something like that, and uh, a crystal with a really slow uh, clock. Um, yeah. And now how do we save power? Yeah, it's like when you're leaving a room, just power off the lights so we can go sleep with the CPU, we can power down the RF interface, we can turn off the UART, the high-speed timer, and the crystal. And now we are down to two microamps. This is also a realistic value. Of course, on the slide before, I told you to have 10 microamps. That's the difference if you're just lo looking at the microcontroller or a whole PCB with um, yeah, other chips around. Yeah, disable peripherals when they're not in use. So now I took the peripherals, made them a little bit larger to get the big picture. Now I want to show you what I think, what we think personally, what should be a good situation where we can uh, say we achieved seamless power management. So I took the peripherals and the clocks and I made little groups of, uh, out of it, and those groups are called power domains. So we have power domain zero to three, and all of them are managed by an, another peripheral, the energy um, management unit. And all those, the stuff is in the silicon of the microcontroller, and it's specific to the vendor of the microcontroller. So we have to ha uh, have a hardware abstraction layer and Riot does this by, for instance, the NetDev driver for the network interface or Perif UART timer, GPIO, RTT and Perif PM. PM stands for power management. So um, how do we get to the power management, uh, to good power management? So Riot has a module named PM layer and it works like this. We have a little reference counter into in the PM layout module for each um, power domain, and we count how many users are currently active in this power domain. So, for instance, you're using a GPIO and waiting for a button to be pressed. So, we are waiting for uh, interrupts. And so, the pair of GPIO has to block the power domain zero. So pair of GPIO implementation knows that the GPIO peripheral sits in power domain zero. If we connect to the network and send and receive data, we look up, it's in power domain two, and then we block power domain two. And PM layer keeps track of the lowest power domain or the lowest power mode it can enter. So when we stop listening on the network, it unblocks PD2 and we are back uh, in the mode where just PD PD0 is active. Yeah, built on those hardware abstractions, we have modules. For instance, we have the GNRC network stack that communicates with the NetDev driver. We have the standard IO driver that communicates with the UART. We have the C timer module that is initialized twice in this case. So 
one time it's on the microsecond basis, one time it's uh, on the millisecond basis. And then you can start to build applications on those modules and interact with them. And I would say we have seamless power management if there is no direct connection between the application and PM layer because everything just works. Now we try to get a deeper look into the micros. <laughs> yeah, um, now we had, want to have a deeper look into the system and I want to show you the current state. So the interaction between the peripheral drivers and PM layout I showed you, um, currently there's almost no peripheral driver interacting with PM layout. So this is a non-exhausting table of some CPU families and uh, driver families. And you can see just the EFM32 has power management here. The NRF has, so the NRF doesn't have uh, the separate uh, energy management unit. So it does all the, let's uh, say, reference counting per power domain internally in hardware. So PM layout isn't required there. So we have power management by accident for the NRF. Yeah, um, and thus Riot has to init initialize PM layout with one user blocked in every power domain. So it, basically if we don't do that, it will just shut off. And once yeah, so we, we have to port those drivers to use PM layered. And once we are there, we can start without any block domains and the reference counting will start working and we can gain energy saving if the user of the peripheral drivers also shuts off the, the peripheral driver. Here we have an example for that. Uh, we have Riot's timer systems. Currently we have three of them but only Z-Timer works very well with um, power management because it can distinguish between microsecond and millisecond basis. And if you're running your timers that are long running on the millisecond basis, we can shut off um, the, the high-speed timer that has high current consumption. But we made great progress since uh, the last time I talked about this topic because event time, uh, EV timer and X timer started using Z timer as a backend and not the peripheral itself. And on top of that, modules are starting to get ported to replace EV timer and X timer uh, with Z timer. But uh, Z timer has a little flaw. So it was introduced by the pull request I made. So I brought PM layout directly to Z timer. So Z timer tries to block or blocks and unblocks uh, the power modes required to let perif timer stay active or perif RTT in this example. And uh, yeah, to get rid of this, we have to, yeah, I, I proposed a pull request that tries to fix this and let Z timer just stop the underlying peripheral instead of interacting with um, PM layout. This has a little cost um, because of introducing Z timer on demand. Z timer has to know every time if there is a user or not. And it's complicated if you have a, a well known pattern that can be observed in the Riot source tree a lot. So you want to measure time duration between two points in time. Uh, in time. First of all, you're calling Z timer now to get the current time, then you do the job. And after that, you're calling Z timer now a second time and just uh, um, subtract those values. And so you get the duration of the task you were running. And Z timer don't have, doesn't know that you are utilizing Z timer to measure time. And so we have to introduce two functions to do this reference counting in this case, 
So before you start measuring the duration, you acquire the C timer clock and tell Z timer, hey, I'm about to use this clock, please don't turn it off. And after you're done, you release the clock. And if there is no user left, it will also shut down the underlying peripheral. Um, an abstraction abstraction was uh, would be nice to have to replace C timer now because this pattern that I showed you here in, in the code could uh, lead to some kind of user account leaks and then we need some kind of wall grind to find C timer leaks and yeah, we don't want that so an abstraction would be really nice to have here. Um, but to sum up, Ctimer is already a really great foundation for seamless power management. And I per personally think that, uh, the Ctimer on demand patch would improve uh, the experience even more. Then we have network devices. So currently um, those are models, mod uh, models like that. We have four different states or we have more states, but those four are really important. A net dev can have the state sleep, so it's powered off. We don't draw any current. It can be in state idle. In state idle, it listens uh, for incoming packets. And once it detected a preamble of a packet, it goes into state Rx and receives the packets. And if it's done, it goes back into state idle, or if we want to send out a packet, it goes into state TX, sends the packet and goes back to state idle. Yeah, six milliamps is quite a lot. So we have to make NetDev um, go into, in, into this state sleep when we are not expecting any packets. And here, I want to show you two different strategies. The first st strategy is like a core response pattern. So we have a star topology in the middle of the star. There, there's a gateway that always listening to, to the air. So it has a power plug. So we don't have to save that much any energy there. And all the sensors around it keep their net dev in state sleep. If one sensor sends out a packet, it switches to state TX. And after it uh, sends the packet, it goes into state idle after TX. So it's able to receive um, replies, so responses in this call response scenario. And after some time, maybe a few hundred milliseconds or a second, we go back to state sleep. The gateway in the middle knows about the strategy and can defer um, packet transmission until uh, the IoT device showed up again and is able to listen. The second strategy allows for peer-to-peer -peer scenarios. First of all, you have to synchronize clocks of all um, participants of, of the peer-to-peer -peer network. And then you use an algorithm to predict when an RX time slot, or when, when, a, when the recipient you want to send a packet to is, uh, is listening to, to uh, the wireless interface. So it's uh, in, in state idle and just send packet when you know they are listening. Um, I learned yesterday, <laughs> open DSME is, is a um, good starting point to look into. I will do it, of course. But uh, there can also be other strategies. The 800.215.4 standard also have power saving built in. So maybe we can adapt to that as well. Um, then we have power savings and per UART because most applications use the module shell um, with the pair of UI backend for debugging and testing. So if you are when you're developing your product, uh, you want or when you are uh, in, in production, you want to have all the production tests and uh, and tests using uh, the UART interface. 
And the problem is because UART is asynchronous, the devices can't predict when they receive data using the UART interface. And so a pair of UART must be kept active all the time and this consumes energy. Here is, I haven't tried that, but it's an idea I came up with, um, a possible solution for that. We can make standard IO to use a pair of GPIO as well to detect uh, start bits. So after some time of receiving no data from the UART interface, uh, we just switch off pair of UART and make pair of GPIO to listen for start bits. And once a start bit is detected, an interrupt is raised and standard IO can turn on per UART and make the UART receive the data that is coming. A possible downside, you may lose the first character, but if you know that you can just maybe hit enter at the first, uh, at, at the first character and then start entering what you want to enter into the shell. Conclusion, so a possible path towards uh, seamless power management. We are here today and in the past, Z-Timer got de facto standard for, for timers, for timer multiplexing in Riot. But what we still have to do is we have to make all those peripheral drivers make use of PM layered to state whether a power domain can be turned off or not. Then we have to make Z-Timer to run uh, the underlying pair of timer, RTT or whatever, only on demand. So when there is an active user of, uh, of this Z-Timer clock. And then standard in should power off pair of UART if it is considered to be idle. And I think, Maybe here on other opinions and views, but I think then we are pretty close to seamless power management. So thank you for your attention. And yeah, before I want to answer your question, I want to emphasize that we are hiring as well. And so if you're into this microcontroller thing and power management, and so just contact, uh, contact me in person afterwards or send an email to jobs at SSV embedded de but i put a forum post yeah, you on the right forum as well there's a job offer forum on the right forum you yeah. can just provide it as the information there as well yeah okay thank you yeah are there any questions from the room yeah, I, mean, I guess I start with Michael. I think he was a microsecond faster than Michael. Uh, yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, looking at uh, this, um, you, you basically have a, a lot of common functionality that will be uh, the same for every peripheral. Um, uh, do you, what do you think about a generic device? handle or something like that uh, what do you think about that so you mean that you abstract every having peripheral no. as a device no. yeah so it, it it smells a little bit like device tree or something like that <laughs> <laughs> so actually i didn't want to start a ride on Riot os so i tried to stick with a pn layer but yeah i i would like that as well so i want to get things started and that's the reason why I propose to bring PM late into the device drivers. Okay, and uh, another question on the, um, you, you had on some of these, uh, um, the notion of you wait for a certain time before you shut down uh, the peripheral. Yeah. Um, did you do some experiments on what, what certain time what kind of a certain time would be a nice size for the different um cases here yeah in so in this application we pick 200 milliseconds because um so we are sending data to the gateway the gateway forwards 
data to some cloud backend then and it responses and we measured that in most cases 200 milliseconds is enough so that's the reason why we picked 200 milliseconds and from the power po uh, power saving point of view it's short enough to not not to drain the battery here and for the UART interface you sh you must figure it out thanks <laughs> In this row, we are all Michael. Um, so um, um, the GPIO listening on the serial port um, that maybe works for the console, but if that was your if that was your network interface or slip interface or something, yeah. Um, you're, you, well, you can things, but um, so UARTs are really good, I thought, at generating interrupts when they get characters. Um, but I guess the point is that in a powered off state it can't do that so power off state of the microcontroller of the of the uart if you put the uart into low power mode yeah. then it won't generate an interrupt when there's a character when the the yeah. stop bit that that is it seems like a really dumb design for a uart that has a low power mode that can't can't wake on land um but you know it's hardware yeah so and the EFM32 capable to run the UART on, on, on the slow crystal, so you don't have to shut it off, but I think that's uncommon. So most microcontrollers need some high-speed uh, um, clock active to, to be able to receive um, yeah, data from, from the UART. There are also some peripherals out there that can detect um, start bits when they are um when they're in low power mode that, right. that's also possible so but not every microcontroller not everyone does can it. do it yeah yeah so and you're but you're using the gpio on this and i think you're just you're programming the the you know the gpio interfaces often can you know turn any pin into a gpio pin right that's what you're doing to, yeah. to do them so back. it's this little switch here is an internal mux yeah um and and you're doing that because you can run the gpio on the the slow crystal yeah yeah in most okay. cases this is possible yeah okay uh, uh, yeah uh, one comment from the chat first uh, um from christian or oh, two comments why are this we, why are we still discussing benchmarking using z timer without running timers this has been known to be broken let's just ensure it breaks always as it already may and at you art uh, or you just don't build the shell into your running application or turn it off on demand. <laughs> yeah, you, you could do that. That's what we are doing currently. So uh, the first 10 seconds of the riot starting, the UART is active to receive data. So it's for production testing and stuff like that. But sometime it would be handy if, if you're testing and your devices is crashing or something like that sometimes uh, the UART is still responsive and you can do a PS or something like that. And that's that's something we don't want to lose. But of course you could do that. So it's it's just an example how we, we could get around uh, the UART being switched on all the time without losing the shell. Um, then, uh, uh, Jose? Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I just have a question. What happened in the case when you have, for instance, a perif that is being used by different threads, for instance, or you have a device that also needs some power modes, but basically you might have two components that want to access to, to these functionalities. For example, you have a 15.4 radius that can, of course, act as a transceiver, but also include other features such as crypto acceleration and sometimes even temperature sensor. So mm -hmm. basically, you still need like I mean it's not that easy to just take one module and turn off the radio because you don't know what the basically what the perif is doing. So do you think the concept of PM layer could be also used for this kind of power management where you need uh, basically to handle so a whole device? So actually at the EFM32, their stack also has power management. So it was a little bit hard to get rid of it and make it by yourself, but it was really easy to adopt PM layer there. So basically the rule for this microcontroller was uh, don't turn off a certain power domain if you uh, relying on on the radio and so once uh, i go into the idle mode the pm mode is blocked and 
when I go, once I go to sleep, uh, the mode is unblocked. And that pretty much works very well. For the sum R30, I guess, the radio is a separate chip inside the chip and you have some internal SPI to connect them. So basically what we can do there is just power off uh, the, uh, the microcontroller and just wait for interrupts. So the microcontroller can go into deep sleep while the RF stuff is doing things and sending, receiving, or whatever. Um, so it, it's, it can be um, described using PM light, yeah. Yeah, but my question is, for instance, like in the case of the, in case of the summer 21, if you turn off the radio while it's doing crypto acceleration, for instance, then basically it stopped working. So it's not about the CPU oh, okay. consumption, yeah. but the... yeah, you have to keep sync. Yeah, of so course. I... So you have synchron uh, to synchronize those state machines there. And do you think it's possible to also get a seamless? Uh... So all radios I work with, I have ideas how I get PM laid in, but possibly there are some out there that might be problematic there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Haven't checked everyone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And another idea to, towards those uh, Z timer issues. Um, so, uh, how about instead of having one Z timer API that does everything, we would have uh, like two APIs one for measuring time, like wall clock, and uh, one for timeouts, so scheduled events. So, we, I mean, basically it goes in the direction of the Z timer acquire, but uh, instead of using a normal Z timer, we might introduce a new data type. So it's obvious that this is something different than a timer that is used to schedule an event. Uh, it would instead be a timer that can be kept running as long as needed. Um, so it's it's more clear that this is a well user managed timer. You would say would would that be maybe something we should should work towards? Yeah, that, that's what I mean with uh, the abstraction replacing the timer now. Uh, on the pull request I stated there, I made some example ABI that could abstract that away. Yeah. Okay, Carl has another question in the Zoom. Um, how, um, are, um, since we have to disable and enable uh, peripherals, but uh, at the moment, many peripherals are just uh, initialized and then they are kept in the state. Am yeah. I wrong? Uh, uh, is there is there a proposal to uh, add a common functionality to every peripheral to be enabled and disabled or something like that already? So basically, currently every peripheral driver has its own power on and power off function. And yes, once they have been initialized during auto init, they are just kept on. So that's something we shouldn't do. We, rather, we should make the user of the driver, um, yeah, turn it on when it needs the peripheral and turn it off when it's done using the peripheral. Okay, uh, I would say thank you, uh, Jürgen, because we already shaved off some quite a uh, lot of time from the open mic. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.